All right. And when it hits 120, I'll start. What do you think? Boom, 120. All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, we'll let well, the stragglers come rolling in. Thank you so much for spending some time with us this afternoon or morning or evening, depending on where in the world you're calling in from. Uh, some quick housekeeping. So we are going to be recording this session, and we will be sending it to all the registrants. So don't worry about you know trying to take copious amounts of notes. You're going to get a copy of this later. Um, we are going to reserve about 10 to 15 minutes at the very end for formal Q&A. So if you have uh, questions as we go, please uh, use the chat or the Q&A uh, options down below to present your questions to Dean and Danielle, and we'll do our best to answer as many as we can in the time that we have. So as of this morning, and I think probably as of the as, the, as you're joining us now, we were closing in at about 500 registrants for this webinar. Uh, and we believe that really underlines the fact that lean portfolio management is one of the fastest growing and most talked about subject areas in both the industry and certainly at Scaled Agile. So we're very thankful for you guys to have the strong response to come here. And we think it's probably due to the subject matter or let's face it, it's probably Danielle and Dima since they're the be experts on this, or you just love listening to the sound of my voice. I'm gonna go with some of all three options just there. So uh, as, we move, as we move into the presentation itself, as folks, as folks establish their baseline level of Agile maturity and they get a few Agile release trains launched, you know, lean portfolio management naturally comes into the conversation as companies make the move from funding you know, short-lived project teams and want to make that shift to more of a capacity model, instead funding long-lived teams that are organized around value. So since you're here and listening to my voice, you've probably made the decision to start moving in that direction. That's great. But then you're probably asking yourself, well, now what? Um, you know, what, what can we do as an organization to improve our LPM outcomes? What work needs to be done? How do we get started? What do I need to do to be prepared and thinking about this as we go down this path? Those are all good questions, and boy, do you come to the right place. I've got two of the best to help you answer that. Both Dima and Danielle are huge contributors of thought leadership around safe, lean portfolio management practice. Dima is actually one of the product managers for LPM. So yes, she knows a thing or two about a thing or two, and Danielle has written multiple articles to, to contribute to the overall framework. Dima is also an SPCT, which if you don't know what that is, think of that as Safe Yoda. And Danielle is an SPCT candidate, so she's almost a Safe Yoda, but also very, very knowledgeable in this regard. So what I'd like to do is spend some time with you guys and let them talk about how do we do this thing once we start thinking about doing it? What are some tips and practices that will make our journey a little easier and kind of miss some of the bumps along the way? So with no further ado, I'll turn it over to D&D. &D. That's awesome. What an introduction, Dylan. Um, I, I think I'm going to just sit back and have you present my section in Portuguese, um, just for <laughs> Brazilian audience here. Sure. So uh, wonderful sure. to be with everyone. And Danielle, it is such a pleasure to be pairing with you, uh, especially if most of you may not realize this, but Danielle and I have actually been part of a research initiative that has spanned over a year now um, to advance the uh, Lean Portfolio Management guidance and IPs based on what's in the field. So let's go ahead um, and take a look. So in the summer of 2019, Scaled Agile released our uh, Lean Portfolio Management course. Um, we designed that course to kind of fill a knowledge gap uh, we never intended it to be a high growth course because again, think of like how many people in your arts and implementations and there's a very small subset that will be engaged in LPM. Well, to our surprise, uh, this has become our fastest growing course, mostly run in private settings. Um, and from what we've observed and what we've heard back from customers, many, many, many enterprises have started to implement um, LPM back from that from that point in time. So in essence, the, 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 the course helped fuel or trigger a journey of, of growth of enterprises uh, taking on LPM. 
we definitely have crossed the chasm. If you're sitting back and you're wondering, do I consider LPM in my organization or is it a fad? I'm telling you now, it is definitely across the chasm. Uh, most enterprises with any form of SAFE has either started, ventured, advanced uh, into LPM. So a lot of peer feedback that you can get and, and help that you can get from other um, entities. So what do we do when we've had, let's do the math, three years now, wow. When we've had three years worth of LPM implementation experiences, of course, we're gonna go back. We're gonna dissect it. We're gonna talk to a lot of the change agents. We're gonna talk to a lot of the enterprises. We're gonna see how they're applying LPM, what worked, what hasn't worked, success patterns, failure patterns. Believe me, both are valuable. And we're going to try to synthesize all of that research into some form of guidance that you guys can leverage. So if you go today to the community site, scaledagile.community.com, to the Adopt LPM page, and I'm sure at some point we're going to post the, the link here in chat, um, you'll see first this icon of the six chevrons of implementing LPM, aligning, organizing, strategizing, operate, govern, measure, and grow. Um, and behind each of those, there's an entire page of online assets, e-learning guidance, we call it the LPM practice guide, checklists, templates, everything that we're seeing that's making these LPM implementations, A, succeed in the, in the initial, and B, sustain and continue to advance over time. All of that goodness that we find found we're making available to you. So please do go ahead and start to leverage those online assets. You will realize how involved the journey is and you will realize that you will need Danielle's help to come implement it. So make sure you call her up uh, because you do need a good expert on your side that has gone through this journey, especially in your early days. You can become that expert later on, but early on, this is a high stakes game. Um, we'll cover a couple of um, uh, topics. Obviously, we cannot possibly cover all the findings from the research, but we'll, we'll uh, touch on a few things regarding aligning, organizing, and um, Danielle is going to take us through her techniques for uh, starting to build a portfolio vision and strategizing. So for alignment, the, the pattern that kept coming up again and again and again in the implementations that have succeeded is they were having change leadership, effective organizational change techniques, front and center incorporated as part of their LPM implementation. Do not make the mistake of starting to implement LPM focused on the technical aspects only, the mechanics only. This is a people game, this is a change game. So we've actually synthesized a bunch of guidance uh, that we derived from John Carter's or Carter Institute's latest thinking. If, you're, if these look familiar, these are his latest version of the eight principles for effective uh, change leadership. And you will see that we go into almost most of these from creating the uh, case for change, the sense of urgency, building the coalition, the one I like is number four, is enlisting a volunteer army. You'll notice this is a shift from the older days. If you ever led, uh, read uh, Leading Change uh, by John Carter <clears throat> back in grad school, I guess, or undergrad, uh, this back then it was more of a push, right? Change initiatives are pushed. Um, now this is more of a pull. You want to actually put things in place in order to attract people to come in and want to be part of the journey to build that army of volunteers to reach that tipping point. So you'll also see a few tips uh, to help accomplish that. So um, creating the sense of urgency, we found that it's really useful to have a strong case for change. Uh, a, you do need executive support. You do need senior leadership support, but sometimes it actually helps crystallize that support 
by having a very concrete case for change. So we give you a few examples. The one example that um, I put here on the slide, it, I personally have done it at a financial services company where we basically did our homework. We, we studied the, the, the projects and major initiatives that that organization had gone through over the past couple of years. We found that an average initiative from the moment it's staffed till uh, the first major release is about a year long. But then we also realized that those initiatives, when we went back to when it was first identified as a need, that number went from one year to three years, four years, five years. So really long cost of delay, really significant cost of delay. And that all happens when you start factoring in, first of all, sensing, proving, annual planning, getting through to strategy, allocating the funding, freeing up the people to get them on your initiative. That's why it takes so long before you can even get in there. By the time you start the initiative, it is um, not as likely that it's as valuable as it was back when it was first a sense idea. So clearly we need to have a, a, a system that's responsive and adaptive for, um, for our prioritization, uh, governance, funding decisions, and that's why we wanted LPM. Um, so yeah, do your homework, look at the data, find ways to actually demonstrate a real case for change. The next one, which I know Danielle was very uh, involved with as well, is we started to say, well, what are the roles? What are the personas? Who touches LPM? Who should be part of LPM in those instances where we really have found it to be a, a fairly uh, humming and successful system? Um, we realize it's not going to be roles as in roles on the safe big picture. Unlike Scrum Master, RTE, Architect, this is, uh, LPM is a responsibility for somebody that has another defined role. So we said, let's synthesize what those responsibilities are. So we have better language to describe who needs to be where and how to better engage them. So let's take a look. First, we had the most senior decision makers, the fiduciaries, right? Think of the person in your organization that can approve that $100 million initiative. If it's not you, it's that person. Then we had a layer of leaders that are highly influential in that decision. They are closest. Maybe all the arts roll up to them from a people management perspective. Uh, maybe they, you also have a function we, we, we found in there, a strategy function. So if you have strategy people either sitting in the enterprise or in your BU or partnering with external strategy consultancies, <clears throat> they are the, the ones that are helping influence the business go-to-market strategy of your firm. That is a huge influence on, on your portfolio vision, ultimately. We want them as part of the fold. We want them to be part of the LPM. So uh, influence, uh, they, they're, they're bucketed and they're in the influencers bucket as well. And then you have the people that are actually proposing the initiatives, right? Uh, those are the ones that fosters an epic. Um, epic owners is what SAFE tends to call that role. Uh, we found them coming from architecture, from product solution management. We found them from all across certain business owners. But I have to say in one instance where uh, it was about 75%, 80% coming from architecture and product management. Right? So it's not prescribed, but that's what the pattern we're seeing. So look at that triangle of people. How do we engage them? Well, we're gonna have our most frequent cadence in LPM, portfolio sync. Yes, I know early guidance, we told you it's monthly. We actually found that most organizations are running it every two weeks or every one week, weekly. So this is, uh, you want it to be lean, you want it to be quick, you want to constantly focus on certain things. So every week or every other week, you have one or two epics queued up for either pitching, coming back, showcasing the results. And this way you're engaging those three bubbles, those three parties in real economic-based, healthy value-based conversations. Why? Because we want LPM to be a continuous adaptive decisioning system. We don't want to revert back to a once a year or twice a year uh, prioritization decision. Then 
we started to look into other functions that quite frankly, if you don't engage them and you don't engage them effectively, they're, they tend to either take a seat back, but that's on a best case scenario, worst case scenario, they become a resistor to your LPM journey, but they, we need them, we need them. So think of the finance function. And if you're thinking, what do I need from finance? Well, they're gonna be justifying the ROI. They're gonna be creating some uh, material and analysis. Their own financial reporting is indirectly impacted by the uh, practices that we're gonna to start to introduce in LPM. Legal function, we've had them engaged in here. Um, HR, when you adjust uh, the, the team assignments, et cetera. So these supporting functions, you do want to engage them. They're not necessarily in the day-to-day -day decisioning and prioritization, but you certainly want to have them in the quarterly portfolio strategic review. And then we found two distinct uh, responsibilities. Those who implement LPM, Think of the laces, the coaches, the, the portfolio experts, the Danielle. And those who facilitate the portfolio operations. Now, in the early days of your LPM journey, they're shoulder to shoulder. They may even seem like the same people. You may even have the implementer help facilitate some of those portfolio things. But guess what? At some point, somebody needs to own the day-to-day -day portfolio operations chasing the, the right information, building the right dashboards and making sure that, that the portfolio Kanban is within WIP and, and flowing correctly, uh, preparing for the next participatory budgeting, not the first one, but the second and third and 10th and 11th, right? Uh, that's the facilitate the portfolio. It tends to be an APMO function separate from the implementer function. The implementers or the lace coaches will help you stand up your portfolio, but then they will soon turn around and go to the next portfolio to stand up or the next art to launch. So how do we engage the two? Let's have an implementation working group. Let's have them meet on a regular cadence. Let's have them advance their work on a roadmap. Let's have them adapt their LPM implementation roadmap on a quarterly basis. And then, don't make the mistake I made, which was in one instance, I, um, I went in, was connected at the right leadership level. We're talking to influencers, we're talking to investment decision makers. We, we are setting them up where we created the cadence and everything. And then we had our first epic go through the cycle and ready to go to the arts. We were ready to pop the champagne and the people in the value stream said, yeah, that's nice, but we have no room for this. So. You want to engage the people in the arts, RTEs, product managers, solution managers, architects, even eager people, scrum masters, POs who, are, who want to be part of this, effectively into your LPM implementation. Don't make the LPM change something being done to them. Bring them along the journey, have them influence, have them part of your change. So we're gonna uh, engage them in two ways. First, we're gonna have an entirely voluntary LPM community of practice. Learn about LPM, learn about what's happening, contribute, be part of this, uh, influence, give us your inputs. I know it's entirely voluntary, but highly advertise it within the value streams. Encourage each of the value streams to say, hey, you want a voice, bring somebody in to this. We want them to be part of this. And if they want to be engaged more, they can even join that middle circle, that implementation working group. And also, don't you forget the voice of the customer. Yes, this is not a product management webinar, but in LPM, ultimately you wanna make the right investment decisions. We actually internally at Scale Agile, we query our customers before a participatory budgeting event and have them do a run on, on prioritizing our epics first. So engage the customer. We also saw a pattern and Danielle, I know you've been experiencing it as well. Uh, that SAFE never recommended, but it's, it's a success pattern. Uh, good LPM implementation start with a high visibility kickoff event. Now they called it different things, but now we're calling it kickoff. It varied from two hours to half a day. It varied from one big session to multiple smaller sessions, but basically you wanna engage all the players. You wanna have them co-create the basic decisions, basic constructs of what this LPM journey is gonna be about. And you're having them publicly declare amongst each other that this is something that we're gonna stand behind. And with that, let's move over to 
establishing the vision and strategy. Danielle, what have you got for us? Yeah, thanks, Dima. I, I have to say, I, this is this is a super honor. I've I've had the pleasure of working with Dima for the past year now and the LPM cohort to come up with all of the new IP, and it's been it's been so much fun. Um, and I've learned so much too from others' experience in the field. What what I had the opportunity to do over the past probably eighteen months or so was take a unique approach um, in the strategize portion of LPM and understanding a better way or an easier way for some of our leaders in the portfolio to come up with that strategy. And so, so essentially what I've done here, and you'll see we're gonna tie together what SAFE um, prescribes to a degree as, as one of the options. And we're gonna kind of go a little bit further with a way that I, I tend to like to do it with some leaders. But, Essentially, the strategy is really what is the what is where is where are we headed, right? What is the what is the approach that we need to take to get the results that we're looking for? And at the portfolio level, one of the key inputs in, into establishing a vision, even um, is is a portfolio canvas. And we've got to understand which which a lot of us that have been through the class, and if you haven't yet you'll get an opportunity to see what this tool is. But essentially it's, it's utilizing Osterwalder's old business model canvas. And it allows us to capture the key elements of the existing current state of the portfolio. It helps us to define the development value streams. What are the value propositions? How do we budget and fund our money? It helps us to understand what do we look like today in, in what we are identifying as our current portfolio. So we've gone through, we've done our kickoff, we've got the right people around the table. We've identified what do we look like in a current state. So the next thing that we wanna do is, is figure out how do we get to that vision? How do we know where we wanna go, where we wanna take this? And so essentially, um, because that canvas is the starting point, allows us to explore different ways where we could actually head. What, what would our future state look like? Well, SAFE recommends one tool and it's just one of many. Um, but one tool is utilizing the SWOT and TOES um, approach. And essentially they help you to be able to take the current state of the portfolio, diverge on different ideas, different approaches. What are the, what are the main benefits, the values? What are we hoping to get out of what we wanna do with this portfolio? And then converge back together and establish what that future state looks like. And then, of course, creating what essentially becomes the portfolio backlog or what we like to call and save the epics. Well, how do we do that? I mean, this is just one tool, but the, the bottom line is, is we still want to go about it the same way. We want to diverge on different ideas and then converge back together on what essentially can get us to a future state. Well, while SWAT and TOES are one approach, I like to take a different approach. Um, and I've had a chance to kind of bounce this off of several other folks in the cohort that Dima created, as well as with some clients. Um, and I have had a lot of success with this approach. Um, so I thought that this was a great chance for us to share it with others. Um, but we know that the portfolio vision essentially sets that long-term context for the entire portfolio. We could go out potentially years. And so understanding that view helps those who are doing the work in the teams, in the agile release trains, to understand exactly what does it look like? What do they need to deliver today that helps us to accomplish the longer term vision? And so LPM is, as you heard Dima say, they're essentially the, the individuals that are responsible to make sure that what those teams and the Agile release trains are delivering on align to that strategy. And so we wanna make sure that we can tie the two together. So we need a clear understanding on, on where we're headed and we need to be effective in how we communicate it. So what I've done, I've taken a slightly different view. Um, I come into this with more of a working backwards approach. And so for anyone that is familiar um, with Amazon's product model approach, um, working backwards, and then um, Jeff Gotthelf, he actually did a little twist to it. But essentially, this is, this is, it literally is working backwards. It is beginning with the end in mind. And it ties very nicely into the way that SAFE really recommends thinking about it from the future, going out into the future and thinking about what that vision looks like. And then essentially letting ourselves know in today's world, what, what is it that we got? Um, what was the vision that we ultimately accomplished? So what I like to do, and it really works well, um, the past, like I said, 18 months or so, we've been in this virtual environment. So I've had the opportunity to utilize some different virtual tooling and we still get the end results. We've still been able to walk away 
with not only that vision, but I have found that this also helps us to get to the strategic themes. The, ultimately, those, those themes that are going to tie back to the enterprise to make sure we're focusing on the right things. So what I do is I'll bring the right leaders. I'll bring that guiding coalition that Dima talked about and any other necessary leaders in the portfolio together. And we go through an exercise, a workshop. So we've already kicked off. This isn't part of the kickoff. This is once we've moved forward, we're now in that strategized state. We're looking forward to what is the vision that we need to communicate across the board so we can continue throughout the LPM roadmap. Well, we, I, I start with these three categories on a, on a whiteboard, on, a, on a, some virtual board where you can experience the collaboration and everyone can contribute together at the same time. Um, but essentially, I begin with questions such as, what business problems did we solve? What were some of those big, those big issues that maybe we're getting feedback from our customers? Uh, maybe we're hearing that certain things just aren't, they're not, they're not making it. Or maybe we need to become more competitive. And our customers are leaving us because they're looking for those new and exciting features and functionality. What are the new capabilities that we delivered? What is kind of differentiating us from our competitors and making us more competitive, making us the product that they that our, our uh, customers are looking for. And how did we know we got there? So what did we track? What metrics did we look at? What performance indicators told us this? And so we, in, in an attempt to understand this, and once we get all of this on that virtual board or even in person, um, we've got the, a really good start to essentially creating strategic themes. And like we've all heard, and it's, it's kind of been the latest buzz lately, is really OKRs, those objectives and key results, really help to, to fully put together what those strategic themes are. So now we've got strategic themes. Now we've got a really good start. So we have two key inputs. We have that current state portfolio canvas, and now we have strategic themes. So those are inputs into establishing our portfolio vision. So as we all know, um, or we hopefully will learn um, by going through uh, an LPM course here, is that we wanna ideally write ourselves that postcard from the future or identify what our vision is. So now taking the same approach with all of those same leaders in the same workshop, we have strategic themes. Now let's start moving forward towards creating a vision. So now we start thinking about what did it look like? We wrote ourselves that, we wanna write ourselves that letter from the future. What are our business owners saying about all this wonderful value that we delivered? Actually write literal quotes on the board. So add those stickies up there with literal quotes, have those business owners, those future Epic owners potentially start thinking about what are those wonderful things that they're saying in the future? and then really get down to it and start thinking about what are our customers saying about all this wonderful value. So write some of those amazing quotes, um, kind of foresee what you may be seeing on those, those different reviews and in those NPS surveys. Then we start looking at um, really essentially some of those, key, those important metrics that we eventually will start measuring, but what are the benefits that we actually achieved? So again, adding those ideas to the board and then some of the stuff we, we oftentimes don't think about when we go through these kind of exercises, what were some of the challenges that we faced that we overcame and how did we overcome them? So really being proactive in thinking it through before we essentially write that postcard from the future. Then essentially what I do is taking that vision or that postcard from the future um, now I want to drive us a little bit more towards what could actually start to build out that initial portfolio backlog, as well as get us thinking about those budget guardrails that eventually come after we've got that vision and we begin to, to, to start communicating. But what, what were the business problems that we solved, right? What capabilities did we need? And what were the metrics again that told us that we got there? So we began with this to identify strategic themes but we're ending with it again so that we can start to foresee what, what could eventually be building out our initial portfolio backlog. So essentially translating some of these capabilities, translating some of these problems that we solved into actionable epics and, and actually going off and beginning to write some of those. And of course, I have actually had a couple of clients that have taken the opportunity that once they got into this storming exercise and identifying the beginning of their backlog, 
we actually took the opportunity to do a WSGIF exercise and just get it started because they actually collected quite a few epics, potential epics um, during this workshop. So all in, essentially what we came up with were several outputs. One key output, key performance indicators. We started with strategic themes and, and the exercise we went through helped us to define those. Then we created our vision, but along the way, we were understanding how we would measure this. How will we know what is going to be that indicator of success? Other metrics that the portfolio would be tracking, um, things such as um, employee engagement and customer satisfaction, time to market, some of those critical things that really SAFE helps us to enable across the board, not just within LPM, um, and other things such as um, that relentless improvement. How are we improving over time? Where are we seeing some of these improvements? So helping us to understand how we will measure some of that. We also end up with a future state portfolio canvas, essentially, or at least the start of it, because we've got ourselves to a place where we've established what that vision looks like. It allows us to build out the future state portfolio canvas, which we can maintain. This becomes the living document for the portfolio. And we, we have to ensure that we maintain that. We potentially have some new solutions to propose or epics to add to a backlog. And hopefully we're also creating a cadence to keep the vision and of course our future state canvas current and, and coming back to it. It isn't a one-stop shop where we just create it and then move forward. We have to make sure we're always looking forward towards the right things and solving the right problems. Now, there were a few lessons that I learned um, in the past 18 months, and I've done this about four times now with four different large clients, and each time took those lessons and improved on it a little bit. And what did I learn? Well, I learned that, you know, you really need to have the right leaders, and ideally, they've gone through LPM training and the day three workshop. It's really important. It's super important. And now with the way that, 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 that the cohort has, has done so many of the updates with DEMA's leadership, it is so much more effective and it really helps you with the how. You also wanna plan for enough time. Do a little dry run. Um, I ended up with the very first client that I did this with, we did it in, in pockets. We started with, well, let's shoot for two hours. We think we'll get there. Well, there was so much engagement by all of these leaders and we just couldn't get folks to, to, to quiet down. We couldn't get them to stop storming their ideas. So we learned we better make it longer because we had to do it in, in a couple of different chunks. So my recommendation is anywhere from four to eight hours, depending on how many people you have engaged. And really, I guess, how, how large that portfolio is, how many of those development value streams you're supporting. Make sure you've got the change agents included because they are going to help you to essentially take the results of the workshop and implement them. Make sure that they go somewhere, they go into the right places, they go into that future state canvas. That vision is maintained. It's not just, you know, set it and leave it and forget it. Make sure that you define a really good solid agenda and a nice time box. Give yourself enough buffer time for breaks and things like that. And then make sure everyone does understand what the expected outcomes are. What do we want to walk away with? So you don't tend to go off the topic or at least capture things to say, hey, this is a great idea. Let's talk about that in a future workshop or working session together. My next recommendation is get help. The first time that I did this, I had a partner, I had a pairing partner, I had another SPCT, and it was wonderful because we really just bounced things off of each other. And where one of us would forget or miss a topic, the other would be able to read the room, bring it in at the right time and vice versa. And so it's really good to have others come in there and help you and prepare um, and make sure that you do that preparation ahead of time. And then my last recommendation here is the tooling is really important if you are going to do this virtual. It doesn't really matter what it is. I have no preference on any particular tooling. The bottom line is that you, you create an environment where everyone can collaborate and contribute. And it is a situation where you, know, you have it at the right time of day. You're not asking folks to skip lunch. So the logistics and the timing are important. But make sure that you have the ability, no matter what tool you use, you can take all of that material away and, and put it in the necessary places. Start building out that portfolio backlog, maintain the vision in the canvas and so that they can be a, a long-term living artifact. 
So, you know, this is, we like, this is one of Dima's great slide quotes that she puts in, um, but essentially, you know, words may inspire, but only action creates change. And that is what's so important about LPM and all the improvements that have come with LPM is that now it is a lot easier to take action. There's a lot more of the how to help coach change agents through how we can do this, how we can implement this and get the expected results and have success, just like Dima mentioned before. Um, and there are so many of us that have, have really learned and contributed towards um, the cohort, but just getting a chance to learn from each other um, and really making this so much better, it, it, it has been a wonderful experience. Before we open it up for questions, I do want to call out a couple of, of different calls to action, just kind of the next steps for folks. So Dima mentioned in the, the community portal, you can go, now it isn't open for everyone and Dima, at least last that I checked and you can certainly correct me here where I'm wrong. If you have already attended LPM, you do have access to adopt LPM. If you are an SPC or an SPCT, you also have access to the adopt LPM. And the third category, um, I believe, is it the um, is it the enterprise licensing or correct me there on the third category? That, that's correct. So anybody, regardless of your certification, if you're part of a safe enterprise subscription, then you'll have access. So you got it. Wonderful. Perfect. So I definitely invite you to go out and check out all the new practice guides. We have really great new assets that the entire cohort has contributed to. And I have used them so many times. They're so helpful with clients. Um, I'm so glad they're out there now. So I encourage you to use them as well. And then we are ICON is, um, is hosting an LPM course. I will be instructing the course and it is the week of May 16th. We're actually doing it Tuesday through Friday. They will be half day sessions um, because it will be remote. So May 17th through 20th. If you are interested, please absolutely head to the ICON website. I believe that um, the link has been put in the chat register for the class. Um, we do actually already have some folks registered for this course, and we are offering um, for, for groups of, of different clients, we're actually offering the three, the third day um, getting started workshop um, for those, those um, several clients that are, are sending um, a, a couple of folks or, you know, several folks from each of their organizations. So they get the benefit of that day three getting started as well. So We'll open it up for questions and um, let's see here. Um, I guess uh, Dalen would just, um, are we, we're just gonna share the questions sure. or how would you like us to do that? Uh, there's, there's a few posted in the Q and A. So why don't you and Dima take a look at those or if anybody has any additional questions on the, on the material that we've presented, please fire away in the Q and A or the chat and we'll get to those. We have, looks like 20 minutes. We have plenty of time to cover some of this stuff. Um, just a couple of words on ICON in general. Yes, we are, we've been doing this for about 30 years. We are a safe shop. We, we specialize in Agile at scale, um, but make no mistake, we, are, we also are experts in the fundamentals. I think we see a lot of clients that make the jump to adopting safe and Agile at scale without spending the time to actually adopt Agile and the fundamentals of Agile. And so, Having that foundation in place is critical before you start building a house on top of it. Um, so something a little bit about us, we've trained thousands and thousands of people in SAFE. We have a, a network of 60 active SPCs and a further network of several hundred, um, a number of SPCTs and a couple of rare SAFE fellows of which I think there's only about, I wanna say 20 Eva out there running around in the wild. There's not a lot of them. Um, so LPM is one of the things that we do, but also we specialize in DevOps, in tooling, and portfolio level coaching, enterprise coaching, adaptive leadership, OKRs, everything and all the bells and whistles in between to help you move towards uh, a, more, a more mature, agile understanding and mindset. So give us a call. We're happy to help. We'd love to nerd out and ask, answer questions about this stuff. So feel free to reach out to us so we can have a conversation about it. Um, and then I guess we'll turn over to the Q&A if you guys will take a look at those. Awesome. I, actually, you know what, There's, there was one question in chat that I figured it's, it's worth addressing live because it builds on Danielle's last slide. Um, it, somebody was asking, should they take the getting LPM getting started workshop without the class? I can tell you it is not going to work because what we did in essence is we we took the old workshop 
And out of 70 slides, we tossed 69. <laughs> so it is entirely new and we built it, we constructed it strictly for how to implement LPM, removing any repetition. There is zero repetition to days one and two of the course. So attending the workshop, it assumes that you've attended the course and you know the course gave you the what and the why, the workshop gives you now the how, how to implement. So, and we did test it by the way, in some of our early beta tests, there were a few people that showed up to the workshop that had never attended the course. They struggled, they were not able to get derived value compared to their counterparts who did attend the course. I will take, thanks Dima. How about we, um, we maybe we can go uh, answer a couple of these questions that are out here. Um, so we've got, uh, let's start with, I'm just gonna start with the first one here. Um, can a program manager or product manager be heading up LPM? As we heard Dima say essentially before, it's really, it can be a lot of folks. The lean portfolio managers are essentially the body of leaders that are going to lead the portfolio and, may, and, and, and help them to make the right decisions and lead them towards the right future and align, essentially aligning the execution of what we're doing against the overall strategy. Um, so, I mean, I don't see any reason why we, you wouldn't have admit the traditional sense of a program manager coming from that old formal PMO or program management office, which may ideally be converted to either the agile program management office or what I like to call the, the, the value management office. Yep, 100%. Uh, paired with the knowledge, right? Yes. So um, you, you do want to read up, attend the course, understand the mechanics of LPM, because this is not a recoloring of your existing process. It's a new process. So you want to learn it. And my advice, if you're a program manager and you want to shift your career to be running portfolio operations, great move, but please leverage an expert, somebody that has done this in the past, in the earlier days to kind of get you up to speed to understand that not only the practices, but also the mindset. Right. How many people are typically in a guiding coalition? So that's as kind many of as you can find. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> there, there you go. Yeah, it's it's almost like circles, right? And I'd love to actually hear what Danielle's experience is. But there, there's a core circle that is invested the most in terms of time and effort and capacity towards advancing um, LPM. Uh, those usually fall within the same desired agile team size, right? Up to 10 people maybe, but uh, more than that, they become like the broader circle, people that are interested, that want to stay informed, that occasionally want to review stuff. So, so you want to kind of manage your, your involvement that way, but that broader circle, Dalen is right, as many as you want. That's how we reach what Carter tells us as the army of volunteers. You want to enlist the army of volunteers. So the more volunteers that want to be part of your journey, come on down. What do you think, Danielle? What have you seen? I agree. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it, I, it does make it a little difficult when you start getting too large, but it doesn't, you can create separate, you can create multiple teams. Um, it also helps you to get into a position where you're looking at the size of the portfolio even, because it, the more that you can get involved and the more leadership you can get behind it, all, all it can really do is help you and make you more successful in the, in the long run. I was just going to add, I think it's important to, you know, start small, you know, you don't want to have so many people when you're first starting that everything dies in committee and it's, you know, 10,000 heads all trying to agree on a decision before anything happens. So you don't, you don't have to have 20 people at your first go, start with a couple of people and build from there as you need more coverage. Nice. All right, the next one, when would you introduce LPM? So I'm one of those, um, I, I know I used to always do it in parallel with launching arts. I wasn't one that typically waited until it showed you on the safe implementation roadmap to do it long after you actually implemented your first art, got through the first PI and then extended. That doesn't mean though that it isn't appropriate and, or at that point to make that decision, but I like to do it in parallel. Start my LPM journey at the same time, ideally. Of course, it depends on your appetite as well, because it does mean you need a lot of change agents that can really support that. 
Um, but that would be my recommendation is as soon as you can get going with LPM. Yeah, I, I love it, Danielle. Um, back in the old days, <laughs> the, the, the running pattern used to be you launch an arch, you launch another arch, you launch a bunch of arts to expand your value stream. And once those arts are up on their feet and solid, then you consider moving into the portfolio. Um, three, four years ago, the, the story started to flip mm -hmm. and it became what Danielle is describing. Uh, more and more enterprises are actually starting their portfolio implementation transformation at the same time as the art launches. So the two are running in parallel. So 100% what you're doing. Let's see here. Thoughts on how to shift mid-flight. We were already rolling in a waterfall way and we are, we are trying to shift the behavior midstream. Um, I think this kind of sounds like maybe a portfolio and a traditional portfolio management approach, maybe as kind of how I'm reading this. My, my, my thought would be get everyone through the LPM course, get your change agents through implementing safe, get everyone towards the lean agile mindset to help you to kind of get away from some of that, the traditional waterfall way of thinking and the traditional portfolio way or portfolio management way of thinking. Like Dima said, this is absolutely go, go down the path of this journey if you're interested in it, but it's very different from the traditional way of thinking about portfolio management. Um, and the, the behavior shift is a mindset shift that applies everywhere in the organization when you make this big change, not just in the portfolio. So the expectation there is having that guiding coalition, making sure that you, you know, this is where Cotter, right? And the, the, his, his accelerators come into play and understanding the best way to really influence and maintain that change. So it's effective and it's not just a, you know, a quick hit and it doesn't, it doesn't sink into the culture. Um, but that would be my recommendation is, is really focusing on how you approach the change, ensuring the mindsets are coming into play and, and make sure you're bringing it into that lean agile mindset approach versus the traditional way that you've managed portfolios in the past. But absolutely make the shift in the middle of it. If it, you know, whenever you, you feel the need, in fact, let's honor a, a, agile and let's, let's respond to the necessary change as we need to. Love it. All right, uh, Simon would Ooh, like that, to hear- That one's good, Dima. <laughs> would like to hear about the examples case study on large solution safe. Oh, that's pretty interesting. So, so I can give you the easy answer um, because I'm tar in charge of easy questions and then Danielle takes the hard ones. Uh, there, we have a, a site, I'll, I'll post the link right now uh, on the scaledagile.com. It's customer stories. So you'll see a lot of customer stories um, from Northrop Grumman, from uh, Lockheed, from uh, as, uh, several automotive actually. Uh, Porsche has a really good one uh, where the, the, uh, the internal change agents themselves are telling the story of how they implemented SAFE with a multi-value stream, uh, large solution um, type construct. I don't know, what would you like to add Danielle to that one? Um, I think I think that it, this one can kind of go. We could go long on this one, right? Because this one can really expand into portfolio too. Um, so um, it's a it's a good question. Um, we could probably talk about this one for a while. Um, but yeah, I would agree. Go take a look at some of the, the case studies. Um, there's a really good white paper out there. Um, I think that it's the the SAP uh, white paper on mm -hmm. large solution, and it's a really good read. I would highly recommend that read. Um, but yeah, absolutely. When you have a really large development value stream, whether they are a part of just a solution train or even a part of a, of a portfolio, um, this, this question could go many different directions. The next one, our leaders are going to, oh, sorry. Oh, no, no. I was going to say, there's a good question in chat about how to convince uh, finance people about CapEx and OpEx when you're trying to move to this LPM model. Uh, just for Mandy's point here about leaders that are good at safe, I just want to throw in a great term that we've come up with over the last year. We call it tacoing. It's when you wrap agile terms around the waterfall process to make things appear more agile, but it's really just the same 
<laughs> wonderful processes you've been doing. So we see that quite a bit in uh, in our clients. Don't don't taco your uh, don't agile taco your existing processes. Actually, change them. And with that, I'm officially hungry. Um, so all right. So so sell for capitalization. Um, so determining whether the spend is going to be capitalized or 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 not or opex. Uh, that is something that we frequently deal with in, in LPM implementations. The best advice I can give you is have your change agents that understand lean portfolio management, that have gone through the course, that have read the material, sit down with your corporate auditors, right? Whether internal or external, start with internal and have the conversations. First, do a little bit of education to them on what lean agile is, what safe is, how delivery works. And then maybe even share with them the uh, CapEx OpEx article on how we recommend there's a spectrum from more conservative to a little bit more aggressive uh, capitalization, tagging features and estimating based, uh, shifting from all the way from hours to uh, basically number of stories. Um, and then have them with along with your guidance and advice, derive what is an acceptable way to perform capitalization in your organization. Mm -hmm. um, don't shut them out. This is something you're going to have to deal with sooner or later. So, so do have that conversation, but start first by laying the ground, establishing this trust, giving them a little bit of education on what this is. And honestly, the LPM course has been fairly effective to educate them. Yeah, and you don't want to become the accounting specialist either. You want to leave that to them. <laughs> yeah, I see the follow up there is the, the issue that uh, that they're facing is that finance does not want to delegate to the team on how to decide. Well, decentralization and delegation is one of the critical hurdles you got to get through to make this work. You have to build that trust, right? Yeah, and you need leadership support, right? So you need your ultimate executive sponsor of LPM transformation to actually be talking to the CFO and the VP of finance to make sure that we can bring them along the journey and, and they're not sitting on the sideline continuing to resist. There's actually in the workshop itself, we give you a couple of uh, assets and tips um, on how to start to approach finance, how to understand what they do and how they're impacted by this journey and then how can you approach them. Uh, believe it or not, there's a movement towards lean finance. So separate from safe, separate from agile, there's there's a book on it. And we even linked that book and 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 uh, a talk about it uh, to to help uh, educate our safe community that look, even finance themselves are starting to go through a journey similar to lean agile, it's called lean finance. Um, and also, it's starting yeah. to shift the conversation to make them make finance less of directors and more of advisors go ahead it also really ties tbm into the mix as well so yeah. it, it, it it's it there's a lot at play um when you start bringing finance into the picture um i i i actually think it's also really great if even if you ask you bring finance through the course as well as as even having their own special workshop um, I did that with a financial services organization and we had about about six to eight people that all went through the class and then we did their own private workshop and it was it was perfect because it was you know it was we just were giving attention just to the, those from finance they they got the opportunity to see how important they were and how important their contributions were to this so they did they weren't treated like kind of that afterthought in the portfolio um, there was a question by chemo but i'm not sure she's saying can you or he's saying can you supply the reference here what what is the question about where i'm not following uh, i believe it's the book on lean finance that you guys touched on earlier what book is that um you know what if i can get it back to clayton i'm sure he can follow up would you be able to help us we can we can track it down we can track Perfect. it down as part of the yep, follow -up. I'll, I'll get you the link afterwards um, gone through oh there's oh yes lean finance book okay i think we're good we have answered the questions we have a grand total of three minutes remaining we can give back to you if no one has any other questions uh we have posted the lean portfolio management class in the chat we hope to see everyone there 
thank you, Danielle. Thank you, Dima. Thank you, Krista, for helping put this together. Thank you all so much for attending. You will see the registration, uh, not the registration, the recording links go out here shortly. Um, and if there's anything we can an ask or answer or help you find out information on regarding all things nerdy and agile and finance and faith and tooling and DevOps, please give us a call. <laughs> and with that, happy Taco Tuesday. <laughs> Thank you to everyone and thank you very much, Dima. Thank you, it's a pleasure. And we're out.